And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Data Diversity webinar, A Modern Approach to DI and MDM, sponsored by Information Builders and brought to you in partnership with Speculus Media. There's a deep dive and continuing conversation from a World Transform podcast, which you can listen to at worldtransform.com. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn the webinar over to Phil Bowermaster, the host of World Transform Podcast, to get today's webinar started. Phil, hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Hello, everybody. Thank you all very much for being with us. It's great to be here for this webinar today. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and as Shannon mentioned, I am the co-host of the Future Facing podcast, The World Transformed, as well as our special series, which is called Fast Forward on The World Transformed. Now, in that series, we have conversations with thought leaders who are shaping our future through new ideas and new technologies. And speaking of new ideas and new technologies, have you ever noticed how our thinking and our priorities and even our activities within data management tend to cluster around a few key concepts? It's understandable actually that it would cluster around these because all of these are critical, both to the overall success of our data operation and to the ultimate objective that we have of turning our data assets into business assets. And I think that would include probably everything that is shown here as well as uh, some others. I, I imagine most of you could probably think of two or three others. And then on top of these key concepts come new ideas that we apply to our data management operation. And then we get new terminology that accompanies these new ideas. Now, unlike the core concepts, that, I was, uh, that we were just looking at, these terms are gonna change over time, right? So some of them are gonna become part of our permanent data management landscape, and then some are gonna fall into and out of favor. First they're hot, and then they're cold. And you know which ones are hot, because people just keep using them. You hear them over and over. In fact, it can be fun to, you know, when you're attending a industry event or even hanging around your workspace just to just to observe how often some of these terms get repeated or even try to string five of them in a row play a little game of buzzword bingo it's always a always a lot of fun but when we talk about buzzwords i think uh, in data management when we talk about buzzwords especially over the past decade and a half or so there's one that really stands out call it one buzzword to rule them all right and that buzzword would have to be big data now some of you i'm sure are going to say wait a second Big data is more than a buzzword. Hold on, you can't just call that a buzzword. After all, didn't the introduction of Hadoop and the ecosystem that evolved around it, and then all those subsequent technologies like Spark and Kafka, didn't that all just kick off a whole new paradigm in data management? Well, I think that's a fair question. So surely there has to be more to the whole big data era than just hype. I think that's probably true, but there definitely was hype. And I think it probably tells us something that it's now been more than four years since Gartner removed the term big data from their annual hype cycle. So it's, 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 the hype may be over. The buzz has definitely died down a bit. And that raises an important new question. If the hype is over, what's left? And that is going to be the topic for today's webinar. We're going to be talking about a modern approach to data integration and master data management. We'll look at how big data has failed to live up to the hype, even while delivering value to the organizations that use it. And we're going to outline a set of strategies for how your business can stop spinning its wheels and start leveraging the modern data management technologies and practices that we need to address three fundamental challenges. And those are mapping data from different sources to a single environment, addressing the longstanding disconnect between business people and technicians, and keeping data in context to ensure that it is accurate and 
relevant. So those are not three new problems, but they're three problems that we continue to struggle with. And maybe this modern approach can give us some new insights as to how to solve those problems. And stepping us through these topics today will be Jake Freebald. Jake is the Vice President of Product Marketing for Information Builders. Jake, it is great having you with us talking about this uh, modern approach. Take it away, Jake. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm uh, proud to be here. This is actually my first Dataversity webcast, and uh, I've, I've heard a lot about this great community, so I'm very happy to be uh, presenting in front of you, and I look forward to the conversation with you. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Information Builder's uh, approach to these topics, my personal ideas about them and Information Builder's approach to some of the topics. Just uh, very briefly to state, if you haven't heard of Information Builders, we're a data and analytics company. So I'm going to be focusing my attention today on MDM and data quality and things of that sort. Uh, data integration writ large, if you will, but uh, information builders as a whole also deals a lot with analytics, and a lot of my use cases are going to be around that, and, and the way that uh, my thinking has been informed, I will fully admit, has been shaped by a lot of those uh, analytical style use cases. So uh, with that, uh, let's talk about a modern approach to data integration and MDM, and I'd like to really focus on three, the three major problems that uh, Phil just talked about. The first one is data modeling. I'm going to talk about how we spend too much time coping with slight changes in our business data and really talking about the way that ripples through our entire data ecosystem when it happens. Uh, when Phil mentioned business and IT alignment, we're really talking about the fact that we have trouble communicating between our business peers and our technical peers. We have those two classes of people have a difficult time talking, and I'll discuss a little bit about why and maybe some things we can do about it. And then finally, with respect to process, we see that very often we've lost way too much detail by handing off responsibility for that business data to different people. So um, that, uh, that's really what we're going to be talking about today. And let's get started with issue number one, which has to do with data modeling. Let me state from the outset, I know I'm talking to a lot of data professionals out here, I'm not bashing data modeling in any way. Data has to be modeled many times in order for it to be productive. But one of the things that we saw in the big data era is that people didn't want to model the data before they captured it. They wanted to capture the data and use things like schema on read, which would reduce the amount of government's, uh, governance necessary and, uh, and increase the amount of flexibility involved. Um, so from a big data perspective, data modeling was not something we necessarily wanted to focus too much time on. But when we were building operational applications, when we are building operational applications that aren't based on, uh, on what we're doing with the data after the fact, we find a lot of little changes coming in with, slight cha uh, coming in with uh, any slight changes to our application logic. So, for example, uh, I like to use composers. If, if, you're, uh, if you're building an application that has names in it, you might know that Johann Sebastian Bach is uh, easy to create. Given the rules that you've got around given middle and last names, family names, you can uh, do abbreviations and alphabetizing appropriately. If you're smart, you instead of using first and middle and last, you use things like given middle and family, so you can handle things like uh, Chen Yi, who's a, an Asian composer who, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the family name comes first in those languages. So, uh, you know, you're able to, to accommodate that pretty easily. Good job. We did a good first take on our data modeling. However, we quickly find things like honorifics. Ludwig van Beethoven is, uh, is, is not a guy with a middle named Van. Van is part of the last name, but it's not used in alphabetizing. The B is what you alphabetize with. So you've got a different set of rules that come in when you make this accommodation for the honorific Van and Ludwig van Beethoven, both for abbreviation and for um, and for alphabetization. And we see the same thing with patronymics with Russians. Uh, you know, Dmitry Shostakovich's father's name was Dmitry, so his patronymic is Dmitrievich, and he gets called actually Dmitry Dmitrievich quite a lot. Uh, yeah, you can't, can't handle that like an honorific or like a middle name. And I don't even know a lot about uh, classical music in the Arab world, but I'm telling you right now, those articles L and Al are used differently from either honorifics or patronymics. So by coping over and over again, even just in this one operational application with these slight changes in names that we've had to accommodate over time as we built out, let's say, our worldwide presence or our ability to handle certain circumstances. I've made a, a lot of little changes over time that finally get me to the point where I can do things like alphabetize and, and, uh, and uh, uh, create initials correctly. 
These repeated changes in an operational system's row and column structure cause us to do things in an operational system that's designed for transactions that then have to be reflected downstream into things like your data warehouse. Data warehouses aren't designed for transactions, they're designed for abstractions. So all these things get exploded out into multiple tables and so on and they get handled differently. And then when I want to do analytics, well that actually gets put into a data mart that's designed for analysis and that's managed in a completely different way using different structures like star schemas and so on. So the, the big problem, one of the big problems that we've had is that with this one operational application and the changes that have been made for it, I've got many different changes downstream of that in the data where I'm modeling for different reasons in different areas, and, and that's caused me to have a whole lot of headaches involved in, uh, in managing the data as it flows from one use case to the next use case. And, and that's just for one operational application. When we do this with 20 or 30 or 100 different applications all coming together, it becomes quite a challenge. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is all the stuff that I just talked about, IT gets it. They hear the word customer and they immediately explode it into 100 tables so that they can talk about customer effectively. Um, they want the model in order to be able to manage the data appropriately. They want to be able to govern that data and they're very, very suspicious of quick fixes, which means when somebody from the business side comes to them and says, yeah, this modeling stuff you're talking about is slowing me down, they're immediately nervous about whatever the business is going to offer as a supposed fix to that. And they're nervous that the business is going to go out and buy some new application or some new tool. They're going to do data prep. They're going to do shadow IT that's going to be completely outside of any governed scope and, uh, and, and is going to, in their, in their belief, in the business side's belief, going to speed things up. But in the IT side's belief, it's going to, to, to make a mess out of any kind of governance that we try to put in place. And of course, you know that over time, the business is going to say, well, we've created this thing that's now mission critical. So IT, you take it back and start to manage it appropriately. But it was never architected for that. So we frequently have a hard time talking about what's important because we have different values. The values that we have may uh, have different language that we use. So it's a, it's a major significant problem for us just in being able to communicate between business and IT uh, to get the issues on the table that we need to talk about. And then finally, with many of the processes that we do end up putting in place, we lose a lot of information because we're dis diffusing the responsibility for that business data across many different uh, uh, processes. So, for example, um, with uh, operational applications that are being brought into a data warehouse, you're go frequently going to extract that information, you're going to transform it, you'll cleanse it, and you'll standardize it all in some tool that's being used as part of a, an overall process. On the mainframe, you might see some of those, yes, people use a lot of mainframe technologies these days still. You'll see that being dumped out using mainframe tools, then you'll see that data being cleaned up somewhat and pre-processed before it goes on to the next step in the data warehouse so a load process. Um, if you're doing it from a cloud, frequently people will start to apply those transformations somewhere in the cloud and then push it down, and then you start to pick it up in a more centralized detail process. And the problem that we have here is that these cleansing steps that we're going to be taking are frequently being done in different places, which means you're firing different rules for cleansing in different places, which means that that cleansing isn't actually going to happen the way that it needs to. The metadata that's being used is different based on the platform that that process is being uh, done on, that it's occurring in. And perhaps most importantly is the loss of context and timestamps. You can't take information and say backtrack to uh, what it was before and rerun history as if a different scenario had taken place. Now, this is a true story. My, my mother and my wife have the same name. And that means I have to be very careful about who I text what to and uh, what email goes to whom and so on and so forth. But um, uh, one real challenge that happened recently is that my wife's email address ended up on my mom's uh, 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 credit card account. Now, I think the less that these two women know about the financial situation of the other, the better. But uh, it took a lot of hassle to try to get the uh, my wife's uh, email address off of my mom's account. And it actually happened more than once before they were able to figure out a permanent solution. I think we called back three different times where it was fixed and then it wasn't fixed again. It would show up the next month. Now, to me, that looks like a bad merge somewhere. And all they should have to do is do an unmerge on the master data that shows that my wife and my mom are not the same people. The problem is that by the time that happens, there's actually a lot of downstream processing that has already taken place. There are lifetime values of customers. There are things having to do with uh, credit reporting. There are things that have to do with what kinds of offers each of us is going to get. And for, from the context of the credit card company, not only did it cost them 
uh, some embarrassment and hassle and time and money spent with people on the phone and so on and uh, customer satisfaction, but it also caused them to have bad data downstream and they can't just roll it back. In a perfect world, you'd roll it back, put in a rule saying Sue and Susan are two different people, never the twain shall merge again, and then rerun history so that all of that history would look like it was supposed to have looked in the first place. And in most cases, because the processes are fragmented, the, the rollback is completely impossible. One other example of a place where that might be useful is it being able to say, you know, I've got uh, five regions in North America for my sales organization, and I want to see what it would look like uh, for, with respect to people's quotas if I now had three sales regions in North America. What, what would things have looked like if the business that was done last year fell into the buckets that I want them to be in next year? And now you can have a baseline to roll on saying here's uh, what uh, sales quotas should look like next year for those people. So having this fragmentation means none of that's possible. The, the processes that load that warehouse become too difficult. So Phil talked about big data, how it was a big buzzword and it didn't live up to its promise, but it wasn't nothing either. We learned a lot from big data. What kinds of things can we learn from big data that would help us prevent uh, the mapping of one set of rows and columns to another? And one answer is that uh, you'd use post-relational data. That was a big part of what we did with uh, big data is we took uh, instead of rows and columns, we, 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 we took document models and we took objects and we, we instantiated those in Hadoop, let's say, and made it possible for us to look into those things uh, in a more uh, subject-oriented way. So instead of talking about customers in terms of 100 different rows and columns, we'd talk about uh, customers in terms of subjects and what the object looks like or what the document looks like that contains the information about that subject. So... A modern solution for, uh, for doing the kind of work we're talking about now would include capture, transformation, storage perhaps, and exchange in documents that are subject-oriented in a post-relational store instead of relational models. That's one key element that we have uh, seen come out of the big data uh, 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 history that we learned. So now instead of moving sets of rows and columns, you're moving the entire subject from the operational application to the data warehouse to the analytics. Now, that's only one piece. We also lose a lot of information from context, as I said. So how do we deal with uh, avoiding the di distribution of information, the dis di diffusion of responsibility by the fragmentation of those ETL processes? And one thing that we learn from big data is it's often more efficient to pick up data from uh, like all of the data that's available from a given operational application and just dump it directly into at your, your Hadoop implementation, let's say. So in that case, you're not taking a, a change data capture of the system. You're not doing an extraction transformation load process. You're actually doing a complete pick up and move just to get the data in place. And then you can start to do things like look at what needs to be changed and what has changed since yesterday and what rules should be fired and so on. But what really important part of that is that you've captured all the data as it existed at the time that you took it. There's no question about what data was in that application at the time because you took all of that data and you saved all of it and you timestamped exactly what it looked like at that moment in time. So you know exactly where those changes took place. You've been able to, you, you can do things like apply rules to it, uh, business, uh, for example, uh, data quality rules and data mastering rules, uh, various forms of data integration rules. And you can apply those rules to the data in the store where it landed, so you see both what the data looked like as it existed at that moment in time and every single step in the process that took it from, from how it was to how you wanted it to look. Uh, that is what gives you things like that complete auditability and the rollback capability and so on that we uh, talked about, that I talked about a few minutes ago. So you can't do that using typical ETL processes in a data warehouse. What we learned is that ETL capture and integrate process uh, happens better in some kind of a data capture and transformation hub. That's quite a mouthful, I know it. And as a marketing guy, I understand that that's a terrible phrase to use, but it really describes what it is without any additional fluff. We're capturing the data as it lived uh, at the time that it was generated or the time that we uh, needed to capture it, and we're transforming it, transforming it in that hub in a consistent way so I can see every single step that happened along the way. That is the kind of thing that you can only do in a data lake. It's not the kind of thing you do in an, op uh, in an operational application, but it's the kind of thing that you do in a data lake that applies governance 
to that data in a way that previous um, instantiations of data lakes maybe didn't do so much, where you would just dump the data into the lake and uh, not apply significant amounts of governance to it at all. Very flexible, but no governance. This applies the flexibility without um, having an issue with, with uh, removing the, the governance that's around it necessarily. Now, this can be complicated, right? It's a very interesting process to take place because you are um, taking the data as it lives. You're taking it uh, in a subject as opposed to as rows and columns, and you're dumping maybe everything there that you have to know about a, uh, a customer into your Hadoop implementation or into your, your uh, data store in a way that is designed specifically to be flexible. And it really is a document kind of a model. And that means that when you add something in an operational application, you can just capture that. It gets applied to the data capture and transformation hub, and it just comes along for the ride as that change gets made. And then you start to apply the, the, the cleansing and transformation rules to it after uh, it has already been captured which means that you, um, it, those applications and those processes that didn't need it continue to not get it. If you don't need a patronymic because you're not tracking Russian composers, then you don't need to have that uh, patronymic exposed in your analytics. But in those cases where you do need it, you can start to adapt those processes pretty quickly and easily to be able to, to, uh, to access that information uh, and, and be able to use it appropriately in analytics or in other use cases um, moving forward without disrupting the previous set of analytics that didn't require it. So it can be complicated. It can be, it can be uh, an, an, uh, difficult, uh, in, in, an interesting way of managing data. It's, it's very much like what we used to call, what we still call in some cases, data vaults, with the exception that data vaults were designed to create systems where the data was captured as it existed and there was really no cleansing in mind or no uh, integration in mind. This is like a data vault, but with all of the cleansing and um, integration aspects that you would want out of a, uh, a data warehouse uh, based process as well. So it's a, it's a different kind of mentality to some extent than you would have with either a data warehouse or a data vault, or for that matter, big data on its own. So, this is something that we looked at when we built out what we called our Omnigen product. We actually started this approach because we had built out an MDM platform, an MDM capability, and the more projects we did, the more we realized that we had difficulty talking to uh, business users about the data that we were going to get, the data that we were retrieving and integrating and so on. We had more difficulty talking to them than we wanted to because they weren't really engaged in the process. It was all seen as something that IT did. So it became very important to say, you know what, business your job is to define what the subjects are. Your job is to define what a customer is or what a citizen is or what a product is and not define in this really complicated way that's going to make it so it's got to be fragmented into a bunch of different, uh, different uh, uh, rows and columns, but instead in a way that just deals with the subject as it stands. And, of course, we know that that's not going to be perfect on the first iteration because, uh, you know, the, the business user defines what they want. They say, I need the following things that define customer, and then they come back to you after you've created something and they say, yes, it's what I asked for, but it's not what I wanted. So they start to add more pieces into it or they say, well, this is really more complicated than I originally told you. And being able to follow that iterative process became really important, perhaps the most important thing we did with Omnigen. So we built out that capability in order to make our own MDM implementations easier. And that also involved additional elements of um, of data management that were also not necessarily uh, front and center in these processes to begin with. So, for example, if you talk to some MDM vendors, you'll realize they don't really have data quality. But it makes no sense to integrate or do or master data that isn't clean. My last name is Freevald, spelled F-R-E-I-V-A-L-D. Everybody gets that wrong. It's always spelled F-R-I-E-V-A-L-D, go figure. And if you're not going to fix that somewhere along the line, then it's, there's no sense in mastering it because you're going to have two different people, right, if you use that as any part of your key. So bringing data quality together helped business users define the rules that they wanted in order to get the subjects that they wanted. And then, of course, we realized that master data management isn't the only thing. We need to be able to capture, instead of just mastered subjects, what we consider transactional subjects in MDM stores. So this can be things like in insurance. It can be like the claims that people actually file or the, the uh, clinical tests that they take. Or in, uh, in P&C insurance, it might be the, uh, the claims that they file, the, the, the contracts and policies 
policies that they use. All of these different transactional subjects are just as important as the master data that's being um, uh, mastered in order to, to govern those transactional subjects. So really capturing more and more of that in the store became uh, useful for our customers, and, and that is uh, really the genesis of why we did Omnigen. We, we struggled too much with MDM at the start and said, you know what, this is a problem that somebody should make software for, and we were the people to do it. Um, as we continued to uh, develop Omnigen for the past number of years, uh, we decided that one of the things we needed to do was capture the information in, in an automatically generated data hub. When I talked about capturing things based on subject, and I talked about bringing the entire topic over, maybe it's a document-oriented uh, view of, uh, of a customer, um, I didn't talk about how that stuff gets stored. Do you actually store it in XML and JSON and something else? Um, we don't force you to use any particular kind of subject, uh, pardon me, any kind of document format, but conceptually everything we do is document-oriented. And conceptually, everything we do is similar to that data vault that I talked about before. But those are somewhat more difficult to manage. They aren't something that you can store as easily or, or manage as easily. So we decided we had to do something to take the, uh, the process of adaptation to changing document formats, for example, and automatically generate that hub to handle it. So now you point your information, uh, pardon me, you point uh, your, um, your operational applications that are on ramps, and the on ramp takes on the information, whatever form it takes. Uh, it can be JSON, it can be XML, it can be relational data, it can be whatever it is, and will automatically generate the data hub that, that will store all of the information that you need based on uh, what your business people have asked for. The master data needs to be business user oriented and subject oriented, like I talked about. The data quality rules are built into the process and are applicable across any data coming from anywhere. So, for example, if you just give me a data dump from a mainframe and you give me a data dump from a Salesforce, then we're able to apply the same kinds of data quality rules to all of the zip codes, for example, that are in that, or, uh, or more complex data quality rules, too, like handling um, uh, uh, different um, names and uh, the way that transliterations occur across languages, for example, uh, Chinese or Arabic languages where the transliterations might be different. We can apply those same kinds of rules across data from different platforms and integrate them all. And you can see all of that happen in one place. Of course, it includes the master and transactional subjects, as I mentioned before. And the most important aspect of all of this is that because as much of this uh, as possible, just comes right out of the box, becomes you know something that you tap into rather than something that you have to build. The cycle times become really rapid. So the the business user says, yeah, that's the stuff that I want. Um, you come to them with something, and you you know they say it's what I wanted, but it's uh, it's what I asked for, but it's not what I wanted. That cycle can take a matter of you know a couple of days or a week instead of a couple of months or you know, a half a year. And as a result, we've actually taken cycle times, we, we've taken implementation times that used to go from, uh, the, the, that were built out to about 18 months. This was uh, this particular one I'm thinking of was, um, was six different business domains uh, for a, uh, a, a health insurance organization. Um, and we needed to onboard information from multiple hospitals. We took an 18 month project plan to do multidimensional MDM or multi-subject MDM and brought it into uh, a six month window. And that included onboarding the clinical data from the hospitals. So by, by doing all of this rapidly, by keeping the business engaged, which they only do if they see rapid uh, iterations on what's going on, by implementing a lot of best practices right out of the box, including things like um, uh, data governance, uh, a, a data governance console that allows you to, uh, to, to manage the data, see what's going on in the data, look at mastered records and see if they're correct, look see if, and see if they need to be, uh, there need to be uh, uh, merges that are done or unmerges that need to be done and so on and so forth. And by putting those in the hands of business people where appropriate, all of that makes the, uh, the capacity to support large-scale projects with lots and lots of different kinds of data and, and different operational applications being brought together, it makes all of that much faster and easier to do otherwise. Now, there are specific things that we looked at with respect to things like customer and supplier, where we did everything that we did with Omnigen, but we also built in, uh, we used pre-built models. Like I talked about, I've been talking about customer for quite a bit here. It's one that's in almost every engagement we do. Uh, in fact, in many cases, you have a customer even if you don't think of it that way. So, for example, when we've worked with um, with school districts, a customer is frequently the student. How is the student doing? We're looking at some kind of 
a longitudinal study of, of whether or not people are graduating and what kind of grades they're getting and what the demographics are and how that shakes out. That's your customer in that case. And you can do all of that uh, data gathering and analysis using uh, a pre-built customer model. Being able to link across the different models, so for example, customers and suppliers being able to figure out what SKUs come in from your suppliers and how those apply to the products that are going out to customers and therefore being able to tie that back to um, survey data that shows how satisfied they are, all of that becomes critically important as far as, as linking those models together. And then again, trying to make it built as much as possible, the data quality and governance, the match and merge, all of that kind of thing is, is uh, critical as well. Finally. Nothing is ever static. If there's one thing that, uh, that doesn't change, it's change, they say, right? And so all of these things require us to make sure that we've got a core view that is going to be the same, but then the extensions that you've got can go well beyond anything that we've ever dreamed of. And that means in things like, for example, our, our vertical applications, such as Omni Health Data, which deals with all of this in a healthcare context, or on the insurance, which deals with in a PNC context, or with these customer and supplier uh, um, uh, models. All of those things allow you to extend in particular ways that can then be uh, uh, upgraded and the extensions that you've made come along for the ride with the upgrade. So you're not rebuilding things as you extend the technology. Just to give some, some concrete examples of how that's important. When you're dealing with PNC insurance, for example, some people, some uh, insurers need to address farm holds. A farm hold is when you get more than one say family, maybe uh, a brother and a sister who's married to someone else and therefore took uh, that person's name, and then a, an uncle. And all of those people might have different names, but they want to farm collectively, they use the same equipment, they use uh, some of the same facilities, and they want to get insurance on the entire farm hold instead of each one having their own policy. Well, that's a special extension that's necessary for people who do that kind of PNC insurance. And you wouldn't see it in your typical you know, automobile policies. There's no such thing as an uh, automobile hold or anything like that. So being able to support all of those different classes of consumers through an extension of that 360 degree core view, make sure that you've got the ability to support any kind of model that you need without necessarily breaking the, uh, the, the uh, original model with customizations that you felt couldn't be done before. Again, and this is an example of the kind of thing that comes out of the big data mindset. We wanted to be able to just add stuff in and all the original things that we had created would come along for the ride and the extensions to what we did would, uh, wouldn't break the bank as we did that. When we've seen, what we've seen from this is, again, uh, a lot more value and a lot less time. We've seen the data management tools and a build-it-yourself development environment taking 12 to 18 months. Uh, we can reduce that using Omnigen with all of the, uh, the, the content that's out of the box, the, the MDM, the data quality, the integration rules itself, uh, the remediation portal, and so on. All of that stuff, we can shrink a lot of that down to four to six months. And by the way, um, that brings along for the ride a lot of things that don't normally or that will normally be the first things to drop off. We all have seen situations, for example, where data quality was one of the first things that got lost in a, in a data integration project or where the ability to provide feedback was uh, dropped out or the metadata was dropped out and so on and so forth. All that comes out of the box, so none of that gets dropped off the face of the earth. And then finally, when we do this Omni for Persona thing, either Omni for uh, Omni Health Data or Omni Insurance or Omni for Customer or Omni for uh, supplier, all of those things provide that same stuff plus more, which reduces the project timeline even more than I had previously talked about. So that is uh, a bit about modern, um, our, a modern approach to MDM and data quality and data integration. Um, it is our mindset, so naturally it's gone into the products that we create, and it's a little bit about the products that we have created with this uh, technology and, and some of the benefits that we see from it. And with that, I'd like to, uh, to ask uh, Phil to, uh, to comment and open the floor for discussion. Phil? Well, great stuff, Jake. Thank you very much. And we will take your questions now if you just want to submit those in the, uh, in the field shown there. Just uh, give, us, give us your questions, and uh, we'll be happy to try to answer those. I've got one to start with, Jake. You know, as, as you look back over um, kind of reminiscing over the passing of the big data era and leading us into this into this new era. And you talked a little bit about what are the lessons that we learned from the big data era. 
I, I wonder if one of the lessons is what do we watch for the next time the next big thing comes along, right? What, what should we be careful about when, when the next new technology comes along that's going to solve all our problems? It's a really funny question. Um, if you think about all the big things that were supposed to change the world, they all did change the world, but not the way that ex were expected, and a lot of them lost, right? right? So right. Um, you, you look, for example, at CORBA, which was great, theoretically, but pretty heavy and, and difficult to work with in reality. Uh, J2EE had similar uh, kinds of um, requirements, but that also was frequently dropped. Um, still out there, and a fair amount of it's still out there, but a lot of people have chosen to go with lighter weight methods. You look at web services, which we think of as something that replaced some of these object-oriented capabilities that J2EE has, and Corba, uh, the, the service orientation that Corba had. And um, they were great, but very often the, the first thing that people thought about was using SOAP, if you remember, simple object access protocol, right, which was right, something right. that people wanted to use to build out those, those uh, service-oriented architectures and so on, and people dropped those too. I, I think um, when you look at examples like that, or you look, look at examples like big data, for me, the, the, the things that are red flags are, first of all, people thinking that one thing will solve all of the problems, right? It's this either or kind of mentality. Um, I think that was there with big data. People were asking how they're going to replace the applications they have, the, the, the um, relational databases they have with Hadoop. And I think it was the wrong question. There's a role for, uh, for relational databases, and there's a role for Hadoop, and the two might not be the same thing. So the either-or mentality is part of what, what uh, was interesting to me and I thought was a red flag. I think the, um, the, the miracle success stories were, the, were red flags, believe it or not, because what you had, for example, I remember there was this really one great example where um, a father of a teenage girl – uh, got a um, saw that she was getting circulars from her local big box store relating to pregnancy, and mm -hmm. he was ticked off. He called up customer service, and sure enough, it turned out that she was pregnant, and the big box store knew before he did. Now, that was something that was first held out to me for data warehousing way back, maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, and so people believed it, which meant that business users said, yeah, I want that miracle, and when they said, I want that miracle, they didn't really think through what it would take to implement the miracle. And I think marketers do a disservice by overhyping things like this. Um, I think that technicians need to make sure that they don't have blinders on and are walking into things skeptically. Um, but I think that, that that miracle is a sign that somebody is going to read it and read about it in Forbes and are going to uh, say to their um, uh, to their tech staff, hey, you know what? I want a data warehouse, or I want a Hadoop, or I want a whatever. And um, and I think that's that's one of the big red flags is seeing those very early miracle stories that galvanize people. It's just begging for them to get uh, to to get lost in the hype. Yeah, I think I, I like those answers. Watch out! Watch out for people saying all your problems are solved. Watch out for the miracles, and especially the one you mentioned. Watch out for any prescription. Any any time people start touting that this is going to completely replace X, right? It seems like uh, oftentimes that doesn't turn out to be the case. And the database is a really good example. I remember a few years ago when uh, some really cutting edge folks were essentially reinventing the r relational database on top of Hadoop, and it was like, wait a minute, we already have this technology. You know, you've, it's like you've you've come back full circle. You don't need a database anymore, and now we're building one here. So it's uh, it, it's it's a lot of a lot of different red flags to look out there for there for sure. Right. Uh, now let's let's talk a little bit about. I love those examples you were giving at the beginning, um, talking about the interesting complexity that you you run into in in data sets. And the, the composer example was great because you see these you see these names coming from different languages, from different cultures, and, and names are handled very differently. And so this, this new complexity gets added, and I think that maps very closely to what businesses are dealing with in terms of doing more global business. You are, you are dealing with exactly those, those kinds of realities. And you take that complexity, you marry it with that uh, cascading effect you were talking about under data modeling where the, 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 the problems just get... Uh, they, they just they just cascade through through each iteration. It's it's almost like we're facing 
exponential complexity with our data sets these days, isn't it? Yeah, and um, and for that, I think uh, I think the lessons we learned from big data are pretty appropriate, right? I need to be able to capture what's going on, even if I don't know how to use it yet. I think the problem with big data isn't that mindset. I think I think that's a perfectly reasonable mindset. I think yeah. the problem comes when we say, okay, now I don't need to worry about governance. You know, I'm just going to put the data there and I'm going to just use it however I use it. Well, no, you know what? You really need to think about uh, how I'm going to relate this to other things. Um, let me give you an example there from uh, from healthcare, for example. You've got a if you've got a um, if you have a uh, an EKG, right? An electrocardiogram it measures your heart rate, and if you've got an EKG uh, pumping out data constantly, then a small amount of that data, a very small amount of that data, is being stored in an electronic health record. Well, right. when the electronic health record captures it, maybe you know once a minute, once every 15 minutes, whatever it is, it's going to miss things. So it's going to miss things, for example, like the fact that when you got an injection of a particular drug, um, you had a sudden surge of heart rate for five minutes, you know, five minutes after you took it, and then it tapered off five minutes after that. So, so there's this big surge in your heart rate, let's say. Um, it could miss that. So what you want to do is you want to capture all of the data from the EKG. That's great. So capture all the data from the EKG and store it somewhere because you're going to want to do analysis on that. But the thing is, the analysis doesn't just relate to what happened in the EKG, which is the big data, right? That's the high volume data you've got. What happened is the fact that this data from the EKG came at a time when such and such a, an injection was being prescribed for that patient. And that patient's taking other medications that could have some sort of um, interaction effect with that injection. And this customer, or this customer, this patient, same thing in a way, this patient yeah. has um, a similar medical history that, that, that uh, needs looking into. That context is what I would consider the master data for the patients. So it's not enough to just say, take the data and dump it. You have to take the data and dump it with connections back, with hooks back into the context in which that data was captured. That's going to be important for IoT. It's going to be important in healthcare. It's going to be important for uh, applying AI to large data sets. And uh, so you may not know what you want to do about it yet, but you need to capture the context the metadata, the information about all of that uh, as you're taking uh, a look at, as, you, as you're taking the data that you're capturing and storing it. So it really is that blend of, of old and new thinking that I think is really important to, to having a modern outlook for data integration. Absolutely. It's always going to come down to context, isn't it? That seems, seems like that uh, is, a, is a recurring theme, Jake, every time you and I talk. Well, we've got a question here from Elliot who says, do you see ETL being replaced by ELT? <laughs> so, um, I being replaced by is very different from what do I think the best thing is. Right. Um, I do think that uh, EL, ETL, I think ETL has a long history, and therefore a lot of people have invested lots and lots of money into EL, ETL, and I think therefore it is going to continue to be uh, highly present in the market. Um, I do think that ELT is a smarter way to go. Um, it's one of those ideas that came out a long time ago before the technology was even properly available for it, uh, but it has grown to such uh, – we've, we've, we've caught up to the idea from a technological standpoint, if you will. So I do think that it will become much more common to capture the data as it exists and put that into the place where you want to ultimately do – analysis or ultimately want to, uh, to to manage the data and then start to manage the data. And the reason for that is that it'll give you that data capture and transformation hub that I talked about in the presentation section and, um, and enable you to have much more insight into what happened, give you the lineage that you need, give you the ability to back up and say, uh, you know, what would the world be like if I had applied this data quality rule earlier rather than later as I did, that sort of thing. So, um, so I don't think it's going away. I think a lot of people are still investing in it, but I would certainly look at doing more ELT style architectures because I think that is the, the long-term history of, of where data management's going. Yeah, that's a personal it, it, opinion, by the way. That's, that's, that's yeah. not a company position. That's a personal opinion. Yeah, and, and go, going back to the earlier discussion about big data, I mean, that, that was another one that was supposed to, you know, schema and read was supposed to take care of the problem altogether, right? We weren't, we weren't ever even supposed to have this conversation anymore. And yet here we are still talking about so EPL, funny. still talking about ELT. It, it goes on. Yep. Oh, okay, we got a question from Sen who says, the identity entity resolution functionality. 
The company I'm working at is like a data aggregator where we don't own and can't change the data, but we need to know person ABC is the same as person ABC, XYZ, same, or it's all caps and lower caps. What level of governance would be in an MDM like this? How, 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 do, you, how do you govern that data in that kind of situation? Yeah, that's that's a, a, a classic MDM style problem. Um, I am, uh, you know, I am. Um, my, I go by Jake Freevald, right? That's how I was introduced today. But my um, my handle when I log into your website, if I do that, is always going to be JD Freevald. So mm -hmm. if you can guess passwords, then you can pretty much guess whatever I am now, wherever I am. Uh, my um, my legal name is Jacob D. Freevald, right? So when I swipe a credit card, that's what you're going to see. And you need to be able to know that your fulfillment systems contain Jacob D., that your CRM contains Jake, and that your um, website contains JD. And all of those things have to, have to connect. So um, the key thing here is being able to ascertain that these people are the same person, um, which sometimes is stochastic, right? You figure out what's going on. There are a number of different kinds of rules that are used to, to determine whether somebody is the same person or not. Um, it requires you to be able to uh, link them together, even though they're different in the source systems, but keep them permanently linked together so that you know that all these things are the same thing, that all these people are the same people, um, and to make sure that um, when they point back to the source records, those source records contain the original information because that information is not wrong, right? I really am Jacob D. Freebold, and I really am Jake Freebold, and I really am J.D. Freebold. Um, but so you're pointing back to those source systems, and they do contain all that information, but the information is, um, uh, is, is linked together in the MDM application. So, so that is, is kind of a classic problem. You also need to be able to do things like unlink. I mentioned my wife and my mom having the same name. My wife's name is uh, Susan and my mom's name is Sue. And, and you need to be able to identify that the one that lives in Virginia is, is this person and the one who lives in New York is that person um, and make that permanent as well. Uh, you need to be able to do things like uh, simply manage uh, the the way that diff people might spell their names differently in one system versus the other. If you have a system that allows uh, Chinese characters, then that person might use Chinese characters uh, to put in uh, his or her name at first, and then um, uh, and then use uh, uh, English letters uh, to put in a transliteration of their name in another place. That's uh, critically important. And this, by the way, isn't only true with people. Like if you're a data aggregator uh, with parts, um, manufacturing parts, well, you have the same problem there with SKUs, right? Uh, shopkeeper units. This is yep. a unique identifier for a particular product, but you can have the exact same resistor um, being used, and one is mil-spec, and the other is not mil-spec, and the only reason that one is mil-spec, sorry, suitable for military applications, and the only reason that one is mil-spec and the other isn't is that it's gone through different testing, and any that were outside of a tighter um, restraint were discarded. Uh, so same exact thing, but with different SKUs on it. So uh, this is, this is a, 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 if I will, if you will, an ordinary problem, that needs to be managed with any MDM application and right. needs to be brought to bear at any time you're doing uh, data integration in a, in a high-level kind of a way. Um, I hope that answers Sen the has, question. Yeah, actually, Sen has put, has put a, a clarification on the question up here. Let's see. Let's, let's make sure if we, we, we've addressed the actual question here. What do you think of an MDM system with only the identity entity resolution functionality? That's, that's all it's got. Do you, do you feel like we covered that, or do you want to say more then in, in that light? Um, I think if it only has the identity and entity resolution function, then you're only getting a piece of what an MDM system needs to be. Um, if it doesn't do data cleansing, if it won't um, attempt to reconcile the identity or the entities that you have with the transactions that are associated with them, then you're not able to do a lot of the analytics that you would otherwise need to do. If you're not... Um, I think it's it's part of a solution, but I don't think it's the whole thing. So you're either going to end up spending more money for additional application components to do that, or you'll end up spending time to build things out in order to manage that more effectively. Um, so I think if it only has that, it's probably not sufficient. Right. By okay. the way, if I can just tack onto that quickly, um, that's also true for MDM where it's only a single dimension. You really need multi-dimension or multi-domain MDM 
in order to handle something. Because if you're working in a hospital, you've got a patient, but the single view of your patient is going to have in its context what doctors are associated with that patient. And those doctors need to be mastered as well, because that doctor could be somebody who works at a healthcare clinic, at a hospital, and at their own practice, and yet they're all the same person. They're all the same physician. So you need to have, in order to get a 360-degree view of the patient, you need to have a 360-degree view of the doctor. And so really it's about all the different kinds of domains that are necessary. If you currently have customer MDM in place, for example, that might be a good source of master data for a multi, multi-domain MDM implementation, but it's not really going to be fully sufficient on its own. So we've got another question here from Gail, and she says, how do you ensure context with ethics, especially in healthcare? So we're talking about putting data in context, but now we've got the, we've got a kind of balancing uh, these conflicting concerns here, right? We want to have context, but we also need to maintain ethics, especially where there's privacy concerns, there's uh, those kinds of concerns with healthcare data. How do you do that? Sure. And uh, Gail, you might have been thinking about the example I gave where, uh, you know, you have an EKG and you want to associate it with that patient. Um, There are HIPAA requirements that we keep that patient's information secure and private. And so doing you know, analysis against them could be a major issue. Um, so, yeah, there, uh, I won't claim to be a, uh, a, an, uh, an expert on this particular topic because I could get myself in trouble if I did. But there are definitely steps that need to be taken in order to make sure, for example, that, uh, that the individual uh, patients are anonymized, um, that the data that is in the data capture and transformation hub is secure so it doesn't get released to people who are um, not allowed to see it. So, for example, you might be able to provide aggregate data to analysts where, uh, you know, various kinds of heart conditions and so on are rolled up into a data set where the data is anonymized and no individual patient can be identified by his or her characteristics. Right. So, for example, if there's only one patient who's got uh, MS and diabetes and a particular heart condition and was taking a particular set of drugs, a certain co- set of a cocktail of drugs, well, if you can identify that person based on those circumstances, that could be an issue. So, all of those extractions need to be looked at. Um, but that's part of the reason, again, to make sure that you're not doing this in some external system or in an ETL process that loads a data mart separately for an individual person. That's where you do have the governed data and you can look at the extractions that are being taken from it for an analytics or what have you and saying, here's the situation. I have somebody who's authorized to get the following information and not that information. How do I make sure that they get it in a way that they can use it, but that doesn't jeopardize the privacy of an individual person? It's a balancing act. I'm not going to say I'm an expert at it, but it's a balancing act that needs to be considered for any situation in which you've got ethics. Um, might, Might be worth adding that very often right now, people are talking about AI and ethics too. And right. a good data integration hub should have um, data that could be used potentially unethically if it were just open to everybody in the universe. You know, it should have information in it that talks about individual people and what they want and what they uh, can do. And when you want to Uh, apply that to AI, you get a large data set with lots and lots and lots of attributes, and you want the AI to run algorithms over it to see what shows up. Uh, That's also something that should be looked at, whether it's in terms of bias or whether it's in terms of unethical use of AI. And uh, so that's another consideration there as well. Absolutely. Well, we've got, uh, sticking with this subject of privacy, we've got a question from Narender who says, with increasing focus on privacy regulations, should that be managed in the customer MDM or should it be managed separately? Super question and complex one. Um, The answer is it needs to be in both, in my opinion. Again, this is my opinion. It's not legal advice, all that jazz. But in my opinion, you need to, uh, to use the MDM hub as much as possible to manage what you're talking about. And that management, though, still needs to press outward to the other systems. So let me explain what I mean by that. Somebody comes to you, let's talk uh, GDPR. Somebody comes to you with a right to be forgotten request. What that means is that uh, you have to be able to say, um, they they have to be able to say to you that they don't want any information about them in your system anymore. And by the way, this is customers that are also uh, customers, prospects, what have you, but it's also employees. An employee has to be able to say, I want to be forgotten by your company. 
um, once they've terminated deployment, of course. Um, the, if the MDM hub shows you all of the different places in which you have captured information about that person, <coughs> pardon me, then you should be able to trace all of the sources of information back to those original locations. You should be able to trace where you got all that information from. That should help you identify the different locations and applications from which you need to expunge that customer's information. Now, sometimes that customer information can be anonymized rather than completely deleted. Sometimes it probably has to be deleted completely. Um, but either way, the actual management of it is really more of a business process question, which can use master data to trace where all of the data needs to be expunged from. And then the evidence that you have expunged it can come from those operational systems. You know, you can do things like just, you know, simple example, you take a screenshot of a search where it shows that Jake Freewald was here uh, before I did the expul expung expunging, and then another screenshot afterwards where I did a search on Jake Freewald and he didn't show up, right? So that kind of evidence might have to come from the source systems themselves. But the ability to uh, show, uh, to guide the process and to show where it comes from could easily be uh, centered on the MDM hub. Right, and I, I see a clarification from Narendra. The question was with respect to opt-in and opt-out preferences. Did, do, you, do you feel we covered would, that or more to say? Yeah, I would certainly say that the opt-in, opt-out preferences should be one of the things that gets captured in your MDM hub. And opt-in, opt-out is frequently per usage. So my information might go into your uh, CRM application, but I will choose whether I want you to use it for marketing or just for um, um, being able to send me information about products and services that I've already purchased, right? Those are two different kinds of permission. So it's really about the permissions that you have to use my data, and that is what needs to be tracked as well as the source system. And then what, that way you can do when you, when you put information out, for example, for analysis or for a marketing campaign, you know that you're selecting information that has the right permissions for that particular usage. So absolutely, it needs to be managed along with, as part of the MDM process too. Right, absolutely. Okay, well that does it for the questions so far from the audience. And I think we're just about done here on time, but Jake, I wanted to throw in one more question. We talked a little bit about OmniGen, you talked a little bit about it earlier. You talked about uh, uh, specialized flavors of it for insurance and healthcare. Maybe as we wrap up here, you could tell us about how it's being applied in those or other industries and kind of what the future of it might look like. We're in a kind of a new age of data management. How's that new age going to evolve over time? Well, I think that the, the key thing that everybody comes back to us with is we want more in the box and we want to um, to be able to extend what you've got, but we want more in the box when you show up at the door. So uh, from that perspective, healthcare was an obvious one because healthcare is so complex. It's just brutally complex, both for payers and providers. And uh, so we've had that for a number of years. We built it out with one of our, um, our health partners, the St. Luke's University Health Network in uh, Pennsylvania and Eastern New Jersey. Um, so fantastic product just because it has so much knowledge embedded in it. Uh, with insurance, we've uh, PMC insurance specifically. Uh, obviously, health insurance was covered by uh, by Omni Health Data, but we created Omni Insurance with um, with uh, uh, intellectual property that came from customers as well, and built it out in in the same kind of a way. And I think that the more rapid implementations. Uh, and then extensions on top of that is a, is a key element here, being able to do things like farm holding and so on. All of those things get rolled into the product over time. And what we see is people wanting to be able to just select the elements that they need so, so they know that they're going to get the, the core product, and then if there are extensions for them, they'll get those extensions. We're moving forward right now with law enforcement because we've done so much work around things like uh, the opioid crisis, uh, through making something that um, one of our customers called Google for Cops. I don't think I'm allowed to say that because it's a trademark term, of course, but um, but that's what our customer calls it, where you can find information about, um, for example, being able to find information about where a person uh, gets um, his prescriptions filled, which is something that is in a healthcare um, system that's part of a health network, along with the information about what, where that person lives, which is public information. And when somebody has to drive 10 miles to get the prescriptions filled, then you can know that uh, it's uh, highly likely that, that that's not 
and they don't work near there, then you can you can start to, to to look at whether or not that might be an opioid prescription, for example, that's being filled in a particular way uh, that that might not be legitimate. Or you find a a pharmacy where most of the people who use that pharmacy or many of the people who use that pharmacy are from a long distance away. If you plot that out, you can see hot spots on a map. You can start to see where a, a particular pharmacy might be open to doing illicit business. Those are right. just a couple of examples, but they obviously take data that's from more than one place and assemble it into a view of data about the citizen, about the customer, about the patient, about what the, whatever it is, and is able to, to, to make us capable of answering questions that we were never able to answer before. Um, I think that's the direction things are going. We're going to see specific build-outs of those use cases in law enforcement and probably other places before too long. We're going to see people looking for more AI out of the box. A lot of the things that our, um, our customers are asking for is saying, just highlight to me the rules that you think need to be applied, whether it's match-merge rules or, or uh, data cleansing rules or what, whatever it may be. Show me the, the rules that you think uh, need to be uh, applied, even though those are rules that – you've never built before and that we didn't ask for. Show us what those things might look like. So those are, those are a couple of things that I think I see in our future uh, and the future of the MDM and data integration processes that are going to be coming up uh, pretty quickly, actually. These are all developments that are happening pr pretty quickly. Well, things are definitely happening fast. Jake, it looks like we're just about out of time, so I just want to say thanks so much for presenting all this today. It was great talking with you. Thank you very much, Phil. I appreciate uh, you and Dataversity and uh, – um, and uh, the world transformed for, uh, for hosting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you have questions, if you want more information about OmniGen, do check out informationbuilders.com and also come see us at worldtransform.com. Thank you all for being with us. And at that point, I'll hand it back to Shannon. Thank you both so much for this fantastic presentation. Thanks to Information Builders for sponsoring and making it all happen. And Phil, great to have you on as a partner and guest moderator. I love it. Uh, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. You know, we just love it and the questions coming in. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday to all registrants with links to the slides, links to the recording of this session. And I hope all of you have a great day. Again, Jake and Phil, thank you so much. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, all.